Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to meet one of the world's greatest karate champions, Mr. Mike Stone. Mr. Stone is the only official undefeated karate point fighter in the world, having won 91 straight fights, a remarkable record that still stands today and I'm sure will stand for many years to come. Besides his fighting abilities, he is also undefeated in kata competition. Mr. Stone dominated tournament competition throughout the 60s and early 70s with his fierce, unrelenting fighting style. He is the first superstar of American karate, winning the Black Belt Grand Championships at Ed Parker's first 1964 International Karate Championships in Long Beach, California. He repeated this feat again in 1965 by winning the Black Belt Fighting and Kata titles at the Internationals. In 1971, Mr. Stone was recognized for his outstanding achievements by being awarded the Black Belt Hall of Fame Fighter of the Year Award. He holds the Guinness Book of World Records for the highest flying karate sidekick at seven feet. A man of great insight and innovation, Mr. Stone is credited with introducing the first prototype of safety sparring equipment, which is virtually mandatory in competition today. He is also an accomplished author, having written the best-selling book, Electric Karate, and is the first to introduce the phenomenally popular ninja movies to the U.S. with his screenplay for Enter the Ninja. He has choreographed numerous fight scenes for martial arts films, his, his most recent being The American Ninja. And after completion of this interview, Mr. Stone is on his way to the Philippines to star in Tiger Shark, a movie which he has produced and written. And of course, it will introduce many exciting new weapons and fighting techniques. So, today for the first time, you have the opportunity to see a champion up close and get his insights into the winning philosophy of the martial arts. How you doing, Mike? Very good. Great. That's a hell of an introduction. <laughs> I almost ran out of air. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's only a little of what's been written about you, and I'm very proud to have you here. And I'm sure the audience is very excited about what you have to say about the martial arts and what it takes to be a world champion. Thank you. I hope so. And uh, I'm sure they're wondering what brought you into the martial arts. Well, it actually started uh, when I was in, in Hawaii. You know, growing up in Hawaii, it's, it's, um, it's a situation where there's so many different cultures and, and nationalities that pull themselves together. It really is the crossroads of a lot of nationalities, and as a result, Growing up in that environment, we had uh, a lot of influence with the Japanese, the Chinese, the Filipino, many different races. So, so I kind of gravitated pretty much to the Japanese culture. Mm -hmm. And as a result, started to watch a lot of their films. And uh, of course, with such an Oriental influence, the martial arts, uh, was it being taught all around the islands? Oh yeah, or? karate and judo and aikido was very popular in Hawaii and still is. But uh, and what, where did your formal beginning start? Well, I started actually when I was in high school. Uh, it was my junior year in high school. And I started taking uh, Aikido. And from that, not really thinking about ever getting involved in karate at the time, because my interests were pr primarily in uh, the different sports, in basketball and football and things like that. So, but uh, again, primarily from watching the Japanese films, I really got interested in the, in the arts. So when did you make the transition from Aikido to karate? Well, right after uh, graduating from high school, about two weeks after that, I joined the Army for three years. Right. <laughs> and uh, I did it with thoughts that, you know, I'd be going overseas somewhere to some glamorous place like possibly Asia or Europe or somewhere like that, and I ended up going to Arkansas. Exciting. And <laughs> while I was in Arkansas, well, actually, it turned out to be the best thing for me because what had happened was when I got there, uh, was when I really started my formal training with karate. And uh, I met my instructor there, who had just come from Okinawa. And who was that? Uh, his name was Herbert Peters. He's from Hawaii, from uh, the island of Maui originally. And the style you started? Uh, Shorenru, like Okinawan style, oh, yeah. Very nice. And uh, how long were you in it before the competition started? Well, actually, when this was, uh, oh, let's see, in 1963, and Sport karate in this country was just really getting started. It was really a, a very young thing. And uh, in the southwest of all places was where karate really had a tremendous amount of impact and following in the initial stages of sport karate. And uh, he had an invitation, since we're in the Fourth Army area, which is the southwest and the south, 
uh, to go to a tournament in Tulsa, Oklahoma, sponsored by a guy named Lou Angel. And at that time, I had just completed my third month of training, and I was promoted to a brown belt. So he thought Must that would be... training hard. <laughs> yeah, we were. That's all I did. Yeah. So what happened was we ended up going to this tournament just really to find out pretty much where we were with our training, nothing more than that. And, you know, to go out and have, have some fun with it. But uh, that was the first tournament we went to. It was in Tulsa. And did you compete as a fighter? Or well, I did both. I entered, uh, you know, there's a kind of cute story to that because I, I really admired my instructor very much, and I still do today because of the, the subtle lessons that I learned, not the mm -hmm. obvious ones that everyone goes through, but the subtle things. And one of it was that he had, um, he had such a uh, very simple way of putting things that had a tremendous amount of meaning that I took literally. For example, he says, well, you know, if we're going to compete in this tournament uh, and we're going to pay $5 entry fee, we might as well win a trophy. <laughs> so I took it literally that if I was going to pay this $5 entry fee, I might as well bring home something. Then he said, well, you can enter two divisions of competition and pay $10 and get two trophies. And I said, well, gee, that sounds pretty good. But what he didn't tell me and what turned out to be even better was that for a $10 investment, if I did well in kata and freestyle, I would win two trophies. But the tournament was set up that if anyone could win both kata and freestyle at a tournament, the tournament would normally give them an extra trophy free, which was bigger than both of the other two, just for being the most outstanding competitor. So that <laughs> was like a bonus, an extra reward for your efforts. So that's really what ended up uh, happening to us. I started winning in both divisions and ended up with three trophies rather than two. Mike, what drew you to competition, though? A lot of people, they, they study karate, and they couldn't care less about competing. But uh, what was it that uh, 91 straight fights? I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, what really got me into tournaments was that I'm very competitive, as anyone that knows me, or if you talk to people that know me, I'm very com I really cannot stand losing. I am <laughs> a very poor loser. And as a result, I just try extra hard. And what I may lack in technique or formal training or what may look technically correct, what I may lack in those areas, I definitely make up with my determination and desire and persistence to win. And do you consider the mind a very powerful uh, oh, by strength? Far. Yeah, by far it's the only thing. I mean, you know, if example would be, I think, if, if you gave me two people that were comparable physical ability at the time that I got them, and you let me train with one, for six months with his mind and the other physically for six months, I could almost I ensure that the one with six months, of mental, six months of mental training will be far superior at the end of the period of time. Because a lot of times, you know, we've all experienced this as athletes, that you can go to a point physically where you're totally exhausted, you cannot do another, because you can never train as hard as you'll ever compete. Because when you're actually competing, there's, all, you know, right. all the adrenaline pumps and everything else is happening for you. So you can never really push yourself sometimes in training the way you're going to exert yourself. And what really carries you to that extra portion of exertion is your mental attitude, and, and that's what carries you. The ones that don't or can't do that are the ones that normally quit, fall short, and lose. The ones that have that mental extra is the one that put them over the top. But how did you develop this strong determination? Well, I, I don't know that it can be developed so much as I think a lot of you either have it or you don't type of thing. I think some people are just made that way or are just that way. And I think for those that are, obviously, uh, you know, the ones that, that succeed or the ones that win consistently are the ones that have maybe an attitude that is quite different, not so much a physical ability, but an attitude that carries them far and beyond any physical technique that they could execute. And do you have any type of uh, exercise uh, routines to develop the mind in such a determined manner that yeah you would uh, that someone could more or less study let's say there's a fighter out there and he says boy I have a great roundhouse kick and I have a good punch but mm -hmm. I'm just scared when yeah. I get in the ring I have fear I have anxiety yeah. and no matter how strong you are physically that isn't it isn't going to help unless mentally you can meet the opposition yeah that's the point I made I made earlier that in in fact uh, there are several people that have come to me, black belts, that have already been training for a while, that have done exactly what you said. They've come to me and they say, listen, Mike, uh, you know, I've, I, I, can, I can do anything anybody else can out there, technique-wise. I can execute as well as anyone. I'm as flexible as anyone. I'm as comparably strong, you know, 
within reason of anybody else that I compete with. But I don't know what it is that, you know, I get to a certain point, I win so much, and all of a sudden I kind of hit a wall, I hit a mental block, and I just can't seem to pull myself beyond that point. And with two of the people that I've worked with specifically that I can think of, you know, right now, and the change was a mental change. And one of them, uh, the change was so drastic and so quick, you know, he was astonished himself. I mean, for two years, the closest he ever got was second place. And after just about four lessons of primarily talking to him, not getting out there to do anything physical, we just changed his, uh, his mind. We changed his mental attitude about what he was doing and about who he felt he was. What were his biggest mistakes? Well, it, it wasn't a mistake, again, a physical mistake. It wasn't anything he was executing. Uh, he was just afraid. He was afraid of fighting people. Uh, you know, his primary fear was fighting black people. He thought that, that they were superior athletes, and as a result, whenever he came up against a black athlete during the finals, he always felt physically inferior, and that restricted him from, from, uh, from winning. So you more or less broke down that wall. That's right, yeah. Just changed his attitude about that. <laughs> That's what uh, most people are really lacking. I can remember as a competitor myself in point fighting, uh, I felt prepared physically, but mentally it, there was this uh, anxiety and fear. But when I got in the ring, it was never as bad as it seemed. I never got hurt. You know, you looked at a big guy, he says, oh, he's going to pulverize me. But it never <laughs> yeah. happened. Yeah. Because well, you know, it's like fear itself. <laughs> I, uh, in the yeah. seminars that I do, I tell a little story about myself when I was a child. And the story primarily is this, that uh, when I was a little kid, I'd make a mistake, right? And, you know, the first thing my mother would say is, boy, when your dad gets home, <laughs> you're going to get it. <laughs> well, my dad just left five minutes ago right. to go to work. <laughs> so I got eight hours of fear. I mean, by the time he gets home, I'm sweating, you know, I'm worried, Jesus, what is he going to beat <laughs> me with? You know, I'm thinking of... But what normally happens is that fear never realizes itself. I mean, my imagination gets totally out of hand with that fear factor and worry. And I start creating these monsters in my mind as to what <laughs> may possibly happen. And right. they never do. And when my dad finally gets home, you know, it's like, well, mom told me what you did. And I'm like, well, what, what? He says, well, just don't do that again. I says, is that it? <laughs> you know? And here I'm expecting to get beat to death, you know? But how, do, how does one psych themselves up for competition? I'm sure these fighters want to know how you got through so many matches. And you just, your matches, uh, looking back in the record books, they didn't last more than 20, 30 seconds. Yeah. What were you thinking about? How, did you, how could you control the ring so, so well? Well, let, let me go back to my initial training, and maybe I can kind of set up a mental picture yeah. for you uh, to see how it worked for me. What happened was when I first started training, we, you know, we had these meditation sessions, and I don't mean it in the religious sense, meditation. I mean just to be quiet, be in a place where I can think and try to control my thoughts. And while I was doing this, I, I stumbled onto something that ended up being the greatest thing in the world for me, and that was I started to use my creative imagination to make an imaginary opponent. And I could see myself pretty much like watching, watching a movie, an 8 millimeter movie, and I could see myself from the back, and I could see myself fighting this kind of a vague image, just kind of a shadowy image. And the more I focused and concentrated on that image, the more precise and vivid I could make it. As a result, I found I could control that image. So what I did with my mind was made the image the biggest, the fastest, and the strongest mm -hmm. possible man that I could fight. And every time I did that, when I realized I could create this, I could also create the outcome of the fight. And what I did was, obviously, made myself win every time. So no matter what he did or tried to do physically to me, there's nothing he could hit me with. I would block it, and before he even got started, I could hit him first. So he didn't have a chance. Now, this is some monster I created that is virtually physically impossible to defeat. So what happened was, when I got out there in the ring and actually faced a mortal human being, it was almost like a joke to me. And in my mind, I would tell myself, you know, I'd look across right at the guy, I'd look, I'd look at my opponent and I'd go, <laughs> in my mind, you've got to be kidding me. I'm going to kick your butt.